Welcome everyone to update for Wattle Partners October 2024. Welcome Drew, my business partner. Good to be here as always. Drew, there's a famous movie um, that I love called As Good As It Gets by uh, Jack Nicholson's in it. And it's a bit like markets at the moment. Markets are phenomenal. I think our portfolio's done plus 15, 16% for the last 12 months. 17, in fact. 17%, massive, there you go. Massive for 12 it's months. Better than it gets. It's like, like in markets, they call it like the Goldilo Goldilocks situation where bonds are doing well, yep. uh, Australian shares are doing well, global shares are doing well, literally everything is doing well. Should we Just sell and go back to cash? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Should we? Yeah, yeah. Well, cash is even I mean, 5%. It'd be nice. Cash. It'd be so. nice if we could, but I mean, it's much more attractive than it was 12, Just I think it was just 18 months ago when rate hikes started. So, um, but that's a naturally a question we think about all the time is, you know, what, what's the additional return we're getting for any investment we make over cash? And I think that's important as ever to be thinking about that at the moment. Yeah, well, you can be patient. And, you know, a lot of our clients have got cash and I try to tell them to be patient every week. But, uh, you know, it's hard to be patient. But it's interesting that you talk about Goldilocks period where portfolios have done well, asset classes have done really well. But if you look at the underlying economy, it still continues to struggle. You and I spent some time in the US in the last, 12, uh, last four weeks and you saw, some, uh, you saw the economy kind of starting to struggle and you saw interest rates drop by 50 basis points. With a view, the consensus while we were over there was a view that they'll drop by another 75 basis points before Christmas. Before, yeah. So there's some concerns about the economy. Are we going to recession? There's some geopolitical risks around the world that are blowing up every day, but markets still are looking through that. What's that about? I mean, it's incredibly strange because in you know every textbook will tell you if interest rates keep increasing, then every investment market, bonds or shares, should do poorly. But the, I think the S&P just had uh, almost a record month. It's up more than 20, so the biggest index in the world is up more than 20% so far this year. It's sure. kind of all counterintuitive, uh, but it's clear that there's mixed messages coming from everywhere. Mm. And something we've talked about is that the difference in the economy is that people who have a mortgage or bought, you know, bought a property in the last two or three years, were they're struggling, they're spending less, but then people who have accumulated wealth or have mortgages under control are doing incredibly well. And you're seeing, that's why you're, you're in seeing, seeing spending kind of hold up uh, and you know, retail spending and luxury spending and travel go incredibly well, particularly for retirees. Mm. Because if you had 100 grand in the bank, you're now getting four and a half to 5% income and you're getting zero the year before. So We heard that a lot in the US, money. that higher rates are actually inflationary yeah. because people are earning more money, so they're spending more money. Yeah. Where the, you know, the people in the mortgage belt weren't spending a lot of money anyway because they didn't have a lot of money. So they're spending less, but as a proportion, it, it's actually inflationary. And it's like every month there's more mixed data and information about the economy. You know, one month retail sales are bad, unemployment's gone up. The next month, job openings, companies are hiring again. Sure. Uh, I think where, where we are in Melbourne, we don't necessarily see how bad or, sure. or good it is because it's always consistent. We work above chin chin. Yeah. <laughs> Behind 101 Collins Street, so yeah. there's, it's always busy up this end. But if you go yeah. down the other end of the city, uh, it's, yeah, you're starting to see retailers struggling, cafes struggling, bars struggling. Um, so I think, I mean, the, I don't think it's a two-speed economy, which they've talked about, where, you know, Main Street's doing sure. poorly and Wall Street or, or whatever it is is doing well. I think it's like an eight-speed economy. Sure. Where it's incredibly specific and niche, and it's probably similar in property. You know, as Melbourne and Sydney property markets have been basically flat for the last 12 months, whereas sure. like Perth, Brisbane are up over 20%, even Adelaide yeah, yeah, up yeah. incredibly strongly. So there's there's more dispersion, I think, than ever. Um, and it feels like, so yeah, the US cut rates by 0.5%. It feels like Australia, better or worse, is going to wait. You know, I hate saying things like behind, behind the curve, um, you know, when explaining we're the already, we're, rates. We're and, 25 basis points higher than the US or 100 basis points higher? They're about CAF. Yeah, yeah, and that's why you're seeing the credit, uh, the currency firm up. Obviously, uh, lots of our clients spend euros yeah, it was great. and US dollars. <laughs> so, a little bit too late. We could, before European summer, yeah, probably right. would have been we nice should, for everyone. should go again. <laughs> um, and the dollar you know, moved closer to 70 cents yeah. than at the uh, uh, highest rate it's been for a while. And as that differential between US rates and Australian rates kind of closes up, then you would expect it to go higher. Um, Rates potentially will drop first quarter of next year in Australia, but there's still mixed data. You don't think so? I like a prediction. <laughs> I oh. predicted every. Well, rate I think cut if you watched the January yeah. version of this, I, I said it was this right. quarter. So yeah. I have been able to move it out a little bit to next year. I f um, it feels like the economy doesn't feel great. The more people you talk to, less like in in our 
groups, probably in our friends, people tend to be going out less, people are spending less money, there's houses for sale everywhere, there's... Like, yeah, there's an interesting non-economic stat and our job and anyone that's investing money is to not just listen to mainstream, also look for antidotes in the industry. Um, and uh, we're thinking about going to Adelaide, good friends in Adelaide, for Christmas break. And the amount of Airbnbs that are available, yeah. and then I did a little bit of research, and apparently this time last year, or this time two years ago, only 20% of the same amount of houses have been booked yeah. for Christmas, um, Christmas break on Airbnb. So there's a massive slowdown in discretionary spending because the most discretionary spending has to be hire a massive Trump. beach house for two weeks in, <laughs> <laughs> over, over Christmas, right? So that's starting to slow down. Without doubt, we've talked about it before on these podcasts that people, you know, um, are feeling the pinch of higher interest rates. You can't, you know, there's a lot of investors that invested originally at 2% and now they're paying over 6 maybe even closer to 7 So if you work out that in a repayment, that's, that's substantially It could hurting. be doubling and tripling. And I think what people have kind of misunderstood was that the roll-off of those lower fixed rates, yep. it wasn't just one year, two year, three year, four year. It, it's actually slowly rolled off over this period, so the pain hasn't hit. Right, it's not on the agenda, but can we talk about um, the state of the Victorian government? Because you're seeing some, you talked about real estate again. Yeah. Real estate's not on our agenda, but talk about we real estate it, yeah. and how the Austra Melbourne real estate, especially some of the, um, the resort-type properties, are falling because just the amount of taxes Residential that have been taxing. Yeah, yeah the, yeah. the Victorian government's in obviously in dire straits, and they're looking for taxes anywhere. Yeah. So you're seeing <clears throat> uh, land tax go up substantially. Now there's this kind of vacant house tax, which is going to be applied, which was brought into K in COVID. Now it is applying to the whole state. It was only CBD like Melbourne. Now it's right everyone, here. right? So. Um, and every year it's vacant, you know, tax an extra, extra percent. I think land tax... It goes up 100% year one, yeah. and then, yes, yeah, so it's 1%, 2%, 3%. And yeah, land tax so. applies from dollar zero now as well? Yeah. So any property addition to your, your principal residence, you're paying land tax from zero rather than, I think it was five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars Correct. before. Correct. Yeah. Uh, unimproved value yeah. too. So and yeah. property's been a surefire as much as it can be, like mm. a, a way to create wealth in the last 10 or 15 years because of the yeah, benefit 20, of leverage. years, so. right? Or... Um, it, it has provided not even a way to create wealth, but stability. Yeah. You know, my property I bought for nine hundred thousand dollars. It's still worth nine hundred thousand, and there'll be no mindset that says it's worth less than nine hundred. Yeah. So therefore, I'm happy to consume and, and invest and continue with my life. But you know, once you start seeing the real value of a property you bought being worth less, your mindset will change and your spending habits will change. So yeah, and it's probably why the other states have done so well. Um, Correct. Like you to see Perth up 20, Brisbane up 20, and very broadly. Sure. And we're seeing a trend of uh, not just people with investment properties in, in Victoria, but people that have multiple investment properties coming mm. towards retirement, that more and more people are starting to uh, considering rationalising those to start looking at being able to diversify. Yeah, really good point. Portfolios. I saw a new client yeah. last week and, you know, they would have 20 or $25 million worth of property and yeah. his concern was, I'm income poor. Yeah. So when you look through, not, not the perfect property portfolio, but the problem with property is if you bought it 25 years ago, you got a massive capital gain on it and if you can't rent it out without uh, capital expenditure, you know, because if you spend capital expenditure, what's the point of getting income? Yeah. You just, so... <laughs> You know, in that situation, sitting on a really big portfolio, but you know, kind of poorly managed in a way, the rental income is really, really low. So even with a asset value that is, you know, twenty or thirty million dollars, the income stream's really, really low, right? And if he sells anything, he's going to get capital gains tax. Um, so what do you do? You essentially know, splice a portion of your portfolio off, leave the yeah. issues you have for the next generation, <laughs> <laughs> not, not for you. But you know. Um, we do see a lot of clients restructure, substantially restructure, and we talk about this a lot. Our Waddle client base, and this is not a bias, um, a lot of our clients have made a lot of money in real estate over a long period of time. But in retirement, they choose, not us, they choose not to hold real yeah. estate. So um, We don't claim to be experts on real estate or suggesting people sell. But yeah. I mean, we talk about diversification and the ability to diversify and how much more a portfolio of companies and bonds and infrastructure evolve than sure. an individual property. Maybe that's um, a great segue into what's happened to domestic uh, real estate trusts that we own. Um, and we've seen, because interest rates have gone down in the US, 
Australian real estate listed has gone up quite substantially and we're invested in two um, direct investments in our model portfolio. One is Vicinity, which is uh, we've held for a while, done incredibly well out of. We're actually now reducing our position in Vicinity. Yeah. And the other one is Charter Hall Long Whale Fund, which uh, had a lull of about $3.13. I saw it trading at $4.12, $4.13 um, just uh, on Friday. So, so it's moved up quite substantially. Net tangible assets. So Vicinity is closer to um, the share price. And one of the reasons we're you know, taking some profits and reducing it, uh, Charter Hall Long Whale Fund is about, I think the NTA is about $4.80. Yeah. Yeah. It's only 20% office. Uh, a lot of people think that fund is 100% office, yeah. but it's only 20% office. I mean, it's just finding those pockets of opportunity because mm. the, the listed property index has done incredibly well over the last 12 months, but it's something like 40% in one company being Goodman Group. Sure. So by finding the pockets within the property sector, could be vicinity. I know it's hard to get a car park at Chatterton. Sure. Probably Chatswood as well. But yeah. you're, you're finding the Uber's yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's much probably cheaper <laughs> and less <laughs> stressful. <laughs> but it's, and it's the same in every part of the market, I think. Um, in terms of the other trends, we, we had the... Can I just stop you there? What we haven't talked about is us. And you know, the reflections on the portfolio doing so well are some calls that we've made in the last 18 months. Yeah. And one is to add long duration to portfolios, e.g. buy long bonds, which are now playing out really well for clients. The other one was, well, who else, how can we get a leveraged position to um, long bonds? And that was property trust. So we yeah. went overweight to property trust, which has done really well as well. Property so better from falling into We're kind of talking today deals. forward, and you talk yeah. about pockets of opportunity forward. But, you know, portfolio construction is about finding the opportunities, uh, oversold markets, markets that will do really well, and then kind of put a position in. I think we've yeah. done that really well. One we added in 2012 was gold. Um, <clears throat> 13 years later, I got clients going, we added it, <laughs> you still got it. You still got it. <laughs> what, what's with that? So um, Just hitting new all-time highs in, yeah. in uh, Australian dollars and in US dollars. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's one of the, another one of those things where there's tr all these traditional rules and people expect, you know, higher interest rates to be bad for gold, lower interest rates to be bad for gold. You know, most of the answers is, gold, yeah, it's <laughs> like a lot of advisors hate gold. Sure. You know, the amount of times I've heard, oh, it doesn't provide an income, why would you hold it? Sure. Well, it, it clearly acts as a hedge against everything else that's happening. Sure. It's consistently provide non-correlated returns and it's trading at an all-time high despite the share market trading at an all-time high and bond markets doing incredibly well now too. Explain um, non-correlated returns because most... I we do can't. go straight into the, uh, the, the lingo, don't we? Yep. So non-correlated just means something that doesn't uh, react or perform the same as what your share portfolio does. Or so if shares go up, it goes down? Or shares go up and it could go up or down? It could go up or down. Yeah, okay. I think and that's the key. Yep. Uh, and the problem with hedges, and we've seen that for a long time, whenever yep. we put a hedge in, they tend to they tend to not perform well when everyone else, everything else is performing well. Sure. But that's the whole point. Yep. Uh, if every port, every investment in your portfolio was returning well at the same time, you're not very diversified. Because the whole point of coming to an advisor like yep. us is to build a diversified portfolio that has some kind of certainty yep. over a 30 year period while you're retired. To do that, you need different assets that have different characteristics and perform differently in different environments. Gold, um, interesting in gold's at high, but you can see it go high, higher with what's happening in uh, the Middle East at the moment. And you know, the geopolitical risk sitting in uh, Taiwan seems to be yeah. also quite high. And I, I, I read some things how they could be linked. Uh, you know, Russia's biggest, um, uh, uh, the biggest buyer of oil from Iran. So if Israel hits Iran, then uh, Russia's gonna be short of oil. That will put it closer to China. Um, as it uses China as an oil supplier. So you've got this that goes back into Taiwan. So you've got a real kind of mess that's always, developing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Markets the natural. Don't care, though. No, they never care for some reason. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's inc incredibly bad what's happening uh, in the Middle but East. Then, but I, it, I went to fill up my car recently and it was like super a Super cheap. It's yeah. right. What's been that? $1.60, $1.70, which is really, you have that roll off, I think, of oil prices. But it's always, we, we should always get the question, you know, what does this mean for markets? I think so much of the time it's so limited to that region in terms of economic impact yeah. and because there are a lot of oil producing nations, well that's where the biggest impact is and that will be inflationary. So if you think if, oil, if something happens to oil supply, which the US have hinted about, oil prices tend to go up whether it's for the short term or not and that flows through into everything. You know, yeah. how, you get, how we get ships, how we get retail product here, how we get 
like what our currency does. Yeah. That's that's a, probably the big risk uh, in the next 12 to 18 months if this keeps escalating. But it also emphasizes what's important and what's not important. Um, and you know, the US is incredibly important. Yeah. That's why you keep really, while well, we keep a really uh, tight pulse on what's happening in the US, which is so big, you know, more than 50% of the MSCI is listed in the US. Um, I think something else we didn't touch on there when you went through, you know, the big decision we made 18 months ago, one of them was we have a strategic, you know, we have an asset allocation approach mm. and where a lot of people were starting to try and, you know, predict what was going to happen in the next three, six, nine months. Mm. We basically stuck to our knitting and our strategic asset allocation and this balance between Australia and, and growth and rather than trying to you know pick the next hot thing sure. we stuck to basically mega cap growth sure. and you've seen technology continue to run despite you know multiple multiple calls saying it's overvalued and you know the returns won't be there yeah, yeah. Um, I think it does bring a question about what you do with the incremental dollar so if you're now you know taking profits in you know Nvidia or Microsoft or global shares where does that incremental dollar go? And yeah, I think let's answer that in a minute. Is. But the, the reason we like those business models is because they were um, scalable. They were, the world is an audience. Their yeah. income stream is kind of coupon based um, and they can expand without real capital. Yeah. So meaning, you know, one of the things that I was really amazed with in the last 18 months was the sell off of tech when the interest rates went up. You know, they were essentially a, they're not susceptible. They have no debt like on their balance sheet, assets, right? Yeah. So yeah. why would that happen? And you know, it shows now that they have really strong business models in any economic environment because their operating costs uh, are, are minimal, right? Yeah, Netflix um, price keeps going up, so they're able to pass that on. I think one of the big differences in why we still, we're basically evenly balanced between Australian and global shares is if you look at the Australian index broadly, the earnings or the profit from Australia basically being negative, it's, it's fallen over the last 12 months or it's been very low. Whereas the profit from the S&P 500, biggest index in the world, all the tech companies, the growth is like 25 to 30% year well, on year. You ask, a, you, 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 that's a really good question. Why are we have even valued? waiting to Australian shares and international yeah. shares? Because if we did it, we wouldn't have any clients. Because <laughs> every client that comes in here is in love with their Aussie share portfolio, even though they've performed substantially worse than the Over next best term. thing yeah. that's on offer, yeah. which is global equities. Yeah. So you know, when we started building portfolios 20 years ago, we would have had like 10% global and 40% domestic, and now we're to an even weighting. I mean, I think for retirees, domestic weighting is quite good because it does provide really solid income stream. A free kick, about um, a 1.5% in franken credits benefit yep. for Australia, and that helps you know justify a reasonable but It's exposure. more a value market than it is a growth market. Yep. So if you're looking for growth, don't look for it here. Look for it offshore and yep. you'll find it. Um, but some of the stalwarts are pretty good. <clears throat> I think one of the biggest uh, announcements, there are probably two big announcements. One was around China and the other one was around the hybrid sector. Sure. So we saw... Let's, let's talk about hybrids. Yeah. We, we saw, were, as a firm, we were largely exposed to hybrids um, yep. through the last 20 years. 18, seven and a half years of that would have been highly exposed to hybrids. Yeah. We're less exposed to hybrids now, but yeah. um, they've been a great uh, investment instrument for clients over that period of time that have been looking for income. But the, the government has recently announced some changes to what might, hap might, what might happen to hybrids in the future. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, so a hybrid or is basically, it's a, as the name suggests, it's part debt or fixed income and it's part equity. So it's part debt because you get paid a quarterly or a six monthly interest payment from, yep. the, from the bank. We only, issue, we only invest into bank issued uh, preference shares. And it's part equity because in the worst case, if you know the banks went bankrupt or a bank went bankrupt, which has, I mean, it's never happened <laughs> or it hasn't happened for at least 30 years in Australia. And so, uh, but, it would, yeah, but it, it has happened overseas. Happened yeah. overseas. So credit Swiss. It would convert to equity in that instance and it could be worthless. And that's, yep. what, that's what APRA, so the regulator, uh, of the banks has come out and said, um, we'd like to, we're going to end, this isn't a source of capital for the banks that will be counted against their capital adequacy. And if you change yeah, that, yeah, if you change that regulation, well, there's no point in them issuing them. It's no issue for those who hold hybrids. It just means that the ones we have at the moment are essentially once they mature and you get your $100 paid back, yeah. uh, they won't be issuing anymore. Sure. Under the current proposal. So if I'm a bank, um, 
at the moment, I've got many ways to raise capital, yep. uh, from equity all the way to issuing um, senior secured senior secured debt. Yep. Uh, and hybrids would probably fit in between. Just above equity, basically. Yep. So if I don't have this availability, I'll probably be issuing just more bonds. Yep. Yeah. Lower yep. yield. Yep. Uh, higher in the capital stack. Yep. Uh, but the I mean the the issue, and this is what if APRA makes this decision, that so changes the capital. About APRA trying to help support retail investors? Yeah. Is that what they're worried about? Well, they're worried that the PDS for a hybrid was 100 pages long, but they're also worried about what happened to Credit Suisse and be clear that very, very different structure of a preference share sure. in the in Australia and Europe and very different banks in Australia as well. Yeah, yeah. But, but we lived through the GFC and we yeah. saw, you know, we saw preference shares trading at massive discounts. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know if it's still traded, NABHA. Got redeemed, uh, yeah. Got redeemed, but yeah. you know, that thing spent its life. 50 or 60 cents dollars, <laughs> yeah. yeah under the value of what it was. So investors put their money in with uh, with a view that it was $100, it always stay $100. Yeah. Soon after it was listed, maybe two years after it was listed, it traded at a discount and it got to 50 odd dollars. Yeah. So you could only get 50 cents. So this problem from APRA has been around right for, for a long while, period yeah. of time. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that they'll make, uh, make these changes. So what will happen to say the hybrid fund by beta shares or what will happen to some of these funds? Will they, um, redeem? Will they give us the money back? Will they run out? Um, will they change their structure so they'll go into bonds as well, unlisted as well as listed? That's actually a really good question. I haven't thought too in too much detail. If it's something that's literally only invest in bank hybrids, you have to assume that it'll just roll off and be closed at, at, a, yeah. at, at an appropriate point of time. You're still going to get your interest payments. You're still, if interest rates keep increasing, you're going to get you know, your increasing interest you payments. Your money back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the question would be, where do you go after that? Um, and that's the, the, the question we face all the time. Uh, yields on hybrids are like six and a half to seven yep. percent, uh, including franking credits. Uh, if you if you go into higher quality bonds, well, you're only getting three or four percent. Sure. If you go into shares, you're getting about four percent, but you've got the potential growth, and you also have the potential for losses. So uh, it's unf it's, it seems like it, like if APRA has made the decision, it seems like it's happening. Although most people in the industry think it's an, an overreach in terms of. Sure. Cancelling a source of funding for banks that has has shown no issues for a period of time, but there are hybrids issued by non-banks. Yeah. So it may be that those hybrid funds pivot towards non-bank issued hybrids, and maybe yeah. that market increases. Good. It's more Good about point. banks yeah. can still issue uh, uh, hybrids. They just don't get the capital benefit. They just take the capital benefit. Yeah. And well. then then the question is, why would you issue them? Because mm. it's just a source of funding that they don't that doesn't benefit them on sure. the other side. And as, as is a, with banks firm, most of the time. As an investment committee and as a firm. Our preference um, outside hybrids would be uh, a new asset class that's built in Australia, and don't get this wrong by the domestic asset class that's got a very similar name, um, which is a global corporate private debt, yep. which we quite like. Yep. Um, we don't like domestic real estate backed private debt. Private credit. Um, Pre private credit. credit. Yep. Yep. Um, but uh, so that's probably the asset class that would, would replace positions in hybrids within our portfolio, depending on if we can find the appropriate manager and the appropriate um, appropriate fund. Yeah, it's just switching from domestic to global, much broader market uh, and similar, generally floating rate uh, income. So you're going to benefit if rates stay around current levels, even if they fall a little bit more as well. Um, in terms of portfolio, the biggest influence on the portfolio was probably what happened in China. China had a return of 30%, the Chinese market had a return of 30% sure. in September. Stimulus is back. Uh, nowhere near the levels of 2009 and 2012, where they threw money at infrastructure and property. You know, Everyone's I'm China. Uh, yeah, I know you are. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> winding you up on this one. There's nothing to grind your gears on this one. Uh, but like, and this is probably a surprise to you when we pulled out the portfolio returns was Rio Tinto and BHP in our direct share portfolio uh, were up 19 and 13 percent in the month alone. Yeah. So kind of the standout. But they'd also be the ones that had performed kind of most weekly over the last 12 months. Uh, for the exact same reason. I saw Macquarie's up as well on this thing that I've never heard of in my whole life. Um, some thing called Air Truck. Trunk, uh, trunk, trunk, yeah. See, I don't Air know trunk, what it is. Yeah. It's all these tech names. They don't it's make like any sense. It's like $25 billion. It was yeah. just, uh, so that's the story of Macquarie and why Macquarie is just this, you know, giant profit producing machine. Apparently they've never made a loss in 50 years of operation. No, I don't, sure. shouldn't say apparently. <laughs> 
Uh, but basically, Air Trunks, it fits this theme that's happening around the world at the moment, which is data centers. So any, if you want to power AI, if you want to power businesses, if you want to power anything, you need data centers, then you need access to all that storage and computing power. Sure. So Air Trunk, I think it started 10 years ago from literally nothing. Uh, Robin Cuda yeah. went around, raised $50 million to buy a data center and turned it's it... Normal I, story. Can't, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just, yeah, I think he's only in his late 30s. As soon um, as Paul Macquarie funded it, he yeah. was about to... He was an accountant, I think. Yeah. I think he was an accountant for Next DC, yeah. so another data oh, yeah, centre yeah. provider, and went out and bought his own. Uh, and it turned into selling the business at $21 billion. He's a near billionaire, um, and it's one of the fastest growing data centre providers in the world. Macquarie there, because there's uh, rumours that Macquarie, having they invested into it in one of their funds oh, yeah. on behalf of clients, so yeah. they get a performance fee based on oh, yeah. the sure. final valuation. And the performance fee was in the tune of a couple hundred million solely to Macquarie for, wow. for finding and putting money into that investment. On someone is, else's capital. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, for a company that pumps out, you know, it's, I think profit is something like 800 million to a billion yeah. in a quarter. Well, that's a big jump yeah, on top so of that. And that's why... And they probably have, have it um, on their proprietary account, e.g. on their balance sheet as well. Yeah, the yeah they would have invest, co-invested alongside yeah. there as well. Uh, yeah, because of what happened in China, Asia did well. Um, the likes of GKG kind of underperformed a little bit. They've GKG had exceptional being our preferred active global. manager in global equities. Yeah, but saying that, um, we're with GKG really for the calls of uh, the senior portfolio manager or the CEO, which is, his name's Rajiv, uh, and he's made some exceptional calls. Yeah. So he sold down tech pretty aggressively in the last. Um, three months, which is probably just de-risking the portfolio. And generally, what we're doing is similar to that, where we're looking to introduce uh, more uh, managers into our portfolio that are less tech, more old school businesses and companies, yeah. uh, build the diversity of the companies that we're holding in the international versus a concentrated model. Uh, so there's a, there's a few changes this quarter. And I think something big in the focus of that GKG is he is highly active. So as you, if you're worried about where markets sit and where valuations are, we blend both you know, passive index, something that tracks the S&P 500 or the MSCI, but we also want to see uh, investments around that that are trading more actively or in, are invested into different parts of the market that, that aren't uh, as heavily exposed in the index. So we're more, probably more comfortable allocating to active yeah. management at the moment, we're, but we're retaining a passive index, core. index, but yeah. uh, I think a good example is... Uh, um, and maybe next uh, podcast we can share the actual numbers. But I think the index option versus our active option is about 250 basis points above. So yeah. if you get 2.5% compound that over a long period of time, yeah. then you end up with a lot of money, Every year, right? yeah. yeah. Um, index is certain, sure, and active can underperform, but GQG would pay about 60 basis points versus the index versus 20 basis points. So you're paying 0.4 more. And if you look at this five years number versus the index, Again, I don't know the number, but before be 500 basis points above. Yeah, So that's definitely. a no-brainer in our world. Yeah, and we're always very cognizant of when we're going to pay an active manager or recommend one, sure. that they're doing something significantly different to what we could buy for 10, 20 basis points sure. in the index. But, you know, the lot, a lot of the uh, returns over the last five years come from active calls yeah. from our investment committee, e.g. Yeah. overweight to Australian listed property trusts because we think global bonds are going to go down. So that's the first bit. That's what yeah. makes money. The next bit is, do I do it on an index yeah. basis? Do yeah. I do it on an active basis? Do I do it on an individual stock basis? Do I do it any other way? So you've got to first make the call at the top and then decide how you execute or implement yeah. it. And that will determine if an index is a better approach than you know, um, an active. And I think that's approach. something we continue to get right, which is there's, an, there's a tendency to focus on the stocks or focus on the, you know, the execution at the bottom, mm. but 20 years almost each, Mm. You know, you've, we've had about I'm the same. Yeah. 49. So <laughs> As taught you, what, what's impactful? You know, buying and selling 1% of your portfolio and switching between BHP and Rio, we suggest both, isn't going to be as impactful as, as, 30, <laughs> as having 30 or 25% of your portfolio in Australian shares. Sure. So it's thinking that high level. We know asset allocation drives the majority of returns, and that's where we continue to focus. Yep. Uh, more broadly, for this quarter, so we're still basically looking for pockets of opportunity. We're not worried about valuations, as we said, if the S&P 500's 
growing earnings at 30%, well, it's not necessarily overvalued. Yeah, maybe the ASX, if it's only if it's growing earnings or it's flat, that probably looks more stretched than what's happening uh, in the US, but finding pockets of uh, diversification, really. So we're all about how do you build resilience into your portfolio? How do you make sure if interest rates don't fall, we'll still be able to perform well? If the economy recovers or if banks do poorly, we'll be able to generate returns. So and as you said, clients, yeah. um, a clients for 10 plus years, right? Yeah. So we're trying to manage portfolios on a 10, 10 15, basis, 20. Right? Yeah. So sometimes you do make calls and sometimes they're too early or yeah. sometimes you get out slightly too late, but essentially you keep making those calls over that journey and you typically do pretty you well and substantially returns, yeah. better than you know most benchmarks around. Yeah, exactly. Um, it continues to shine through as well. Uh, so as you said, looking for diversification in value. So that means sort of more traditional cyclical business overseas because we've got a lot of growth and we've been happy with that growth, but now we're looking for a bit of diversification. Uh, finding me, not, not smaller companies, but more medium sized companies sure. um, within Australia. So there's a lack of growth in the top 10. We know you can probably name the top 10 off the top of your head. Yeah, yeah pretty quickly. Uh, they're not, there's nothing wrong with those companies, but parts of the technology, industrials, all these other parts of the, all the country are growing far quicker and you know, have more uh, nimble business models. Um, and then still looking at parts of the property sector as well, as you mentioned. Great, Drew, I, I think we'll leave it there. So anyone have any questions, queries, problems, give us Drew or I a call direct. Um, we're always available. Hopefully this update's been um, informative. Uh, all our clients will get their quarterlies in the next uh, two, two or three weeks. Um, thanks again. See you next time.